and we'll see whether that's true. <laughs> All right, that's doing Ooh, something. <laughs> Hopefully that works. <laughs> Thank you. Sweet. Excellent. We'll just give everybody a minute or two. Yeah, I think there's still a couple of people coming through. Yeah. And herpetologists aren't known for being on time. Yep. Especially not in the cold. <laughs> yeah, that's it. All right. Well, um, I think I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're streaming today. I'm on Wurundjeri country, people of the Kulin nations, and um, I pay my respects to elders past and present and would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands wherever you are today and pay my respects to their elders also. Um, my name is Lynette, Lynette, Lynette Plendeneath. I am the president of Frogs Victoria and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight online. We were just about getting back to normal and, um, and COVID scuppered this yet again, um, but it's glad to, I'm glad to see that we're able to get online and so many of you are able to join us here tonight. I'd like to especially welcome our patron Professor Murray Littlejohn. Great to see you too, Murray. Haven't seen you for months in person, but, um, but it's nice to see you on our screens here tonight. Um, before we get started, I'd like to take the opportunity to remind you that we are currently accepting submissions for our newsletter, Pobble Bonk. So if you have anything you'd like to share, drop us a line. If you've got a frog related event or just a story you'd like to tell, maybe a photo um, of yourself out in the field or um, uh, we've had kids arts and craft photos and all sorts of things in the past. So, so do drop us a line um, at info at frogsvic dot org and um, we'd love to love to see your stuff and put it in print in Pobble Bonk. that's due out in July. So because we're online tonight we've kept this as a meeting instead of a seminar format and that enables us to all have a chat at the end um, but if you wouldn't mind uh, keeping yourselves muted and preferably with your video off as well well Matt Clancy's talking because it can be quite distracting watching everybody else drinking while he's having to present so it would be great if you could uh, Turn your mics off at least and preferably your videos as well. It's a lot less distracting and it makes it a better experience for everybody to be able to hear better too. So tonight we have what I think might be the most anticipated talk in the whole of Frogs Victoria history. We've been awaiting this since the beginning of the very first lockdown last year in 2020 and so it's my very great pleasure tonight to finally introduce you to Matt Clancy. Matt Clancy is an ecologist and wildlife photographer with a passion for frogs. He also happens to be a very esteemed member of the Frogs Victoria Committee. Matt is going to talk tonight about his honours research from the University of Melbourne and with the Department of Environment, Parks and Water Security, which is in the Northern Territory. He's gonna talk about how developing models of the distribution and habitat requirements of species is fundamental to conservation planning, especially for species with narrow habitat requirements or restricted distributions. So I present to you now Matt Clancy talking about monsoon mud and mozzies, modelling the distribution of a range restricted frog. Thanks Matt. Thank you Lynette. Uh, good evening everyone. Glad you can all uh, make it tonight after having to cancel this once already. Um, it's a shame it can't be in person but you got to do what you got to do. Um, so as Lynette already said, I'll just mention again, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are all streaming on tonight, wherever you are around the country. Um, and I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people from the Kulin Nation. So I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and do the same for wherever you guys are as well. All right, I'll get started. Let's see if this works. Okay. So my honours research was based up in Darwin over the 2018-2019 wet season. Uh, and the project was based around this little frog that you can see up here. Um, and I was modelling their distribution. I'll explain a bit, a, a bit more about that in a sec. So the species I was studying was the Howard Springs toadlet, Euprolia davisae described only in 2005 by young Tyler and Kent. As you can see, they're tiny little frogs. They're only about that big, um, about 22 mil. So that's, they're fully grown. That one in my hand is a fully grown adult male. So they're tiny frogs. Um, 
belonging to the Myobatrachidae family, which is comprises of Australia's ground frogs. Uh, and this is one of the smallest in the genus of Euprolia. So I think there's 28 currently described species and these guys are one of the smallest of those. Um, Euprolia are commonly known as toadlets. So you can see this guy's called the Howard Springs toadlet. Um, as most of you probably know, there's no actual toads in Australia, no native toads, I should say, other than the introduced cane toad. Um, this little guy is a frog, as are all Euprolia. Toadlet is just a common name given to these guys, um, basically because they look like small toads. These guys are burrowing specialists. So they spend most of their life underground and they only emerge during the wet season to breed. Uh, and they're monsoonal breeders. So once those monsoons start during the wet season around Christmas time, they'll come up from under the ground and begin calling. It's also interesting with these guys and maybe slightly concerning that they are the first uh, amphibian actually listed as a threatened frog species in the Northern Territory um, under the Territory Parks and Wildlife Conservation Act. And the threats mainly include uh, anthropogenic pressures such as land clearing for urban development, things like mining, um, roads, they've got a fragmented distribution, general lack of knowledge. There hasn't been a lot of research done on these guys. Um, and as I said, yeah, they're the only threatened amphibian in the Northern Territory. Um, all others are data deficient or uh, very common. So distribution, the distribution of these little frogs was the major component for my research. So basically I wanted to work out where does this tiny little frog exist um, and does it occur further out than where it's known from currently? They're a top end endemic. So up here, this section here is called the top end of the Northern Territory. That's just what it's known as. Um, and this, this frog is restricted to the far northwestern area, um, just a little bit south of Darwin or southeast of Darwin um, on the rural boundaries. And as you can see, it's a tiny little area. Um, their entire distribution is prior to this study is restricted to around 40 kilometers southeast of Darwin. So it's kind of like a little 40 kilometer radius here. Um, and the entire species exists within this uh, very small area. Populations within uh, this area are severely fragmented too. So you can even see in this map here, um, there's two distinct uh, populations, I guess, and there's a big area through the middle. Most of that area carved straight through the middle is, well, a major highway plus uh, a lot of agricultural land, which is all being cleared. Um, and amongst other things and mined and stuff, um, down the bottom here is just some photos of the disturbances that are occurring in this species habitat. So you can see sand mining is a major problem we think for this species, um, just carving out sections of forest and basically mining the deep sand um, in which these frogs live. Um, and this renders the habitat unsuitable for them to breed in. Uh, and you can see here um, on the outskirts of Darwin, the rural properties pushing through um, and from that mining is extending out into straight into the landscapes in which they live. Um, and these two areas up here in the north uh, east and west of Darwin are where I wanted to survey to work out do, does Euprolia davisate exist further outside of this known distribution um, as there's similar habitat in these regions uh, that haven't been surveyed. So the habitat in which these guys live is very specific. So there are habitat specialists that are only found in a particular type of habitat. They're not just generalists. They don't live everywhere. Um, they're particularly restricted to what's called sand sheep heathland, which is basically like a sandy open woodland. It's not actually a type of heathland. It's just the uh, vegetation structure and sandy soil is very similar to the heathlands that you would get elsewhere in Australia. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of like a sandy open woodland. And within this broader habitat, you get uh, two similar habitats. You have up the top here, um, what's known as a devil devil micro relief. I'll go more into that in a sec, but they're basically small soil mounds that occur across a wide area or kind of, a, well, maybe even a small area, but an opening um, and 
that's they're created by a small um, worm. And down the bottom, we have a photo of the deep sand plains in which they live. So that, that type of habitat doesn't really have these soil mounds. It's just like a sand pit. It's deep white sand with pandanus growing sparsely throughout it. Um, both of these are annually inundated landscapes. So they're dependent upon a good wet season to be flooded um, and to allow the frogs to come up. And here is it from an aerial perspective. This is a drone shot of one of my sites. Um, you can see thousands and thousands of these little devil devil mounds created by the worms. Um, and these sit above the waterline. So once this sandy kind of muddy site floods, the water level rises and the worms have to get out of the water. So they make these little mounds and frogs utilize these mounds to call from uh, when the sites are flooded. So they'll attach their eggs to the grasses and in the water around these mounds and then they can burrow back into these mounds during the day being a burrowing frog obviously they can't burrow back under under the water um, they need a dry space to burrow into and this is a typical another typical photo of the um, sand sheet habitat with some malaluca growing through the middle of it um, and sparse tussock grasses so my main research question uh, it took me a while to figure this out, what my actual research, research question was, but basically I just came down to working out that it was just what is the current distribution of Euperolia davisa. Um, the dif distribution was quite, I guess, unknown. Um, there's there lots of areas that still require surveys, so that's what I was up there to do. And then basically incorporating this into a distribution model. So. Uh, working out which habitat predictors influence site occupancy of Euperole davisa across its range. So things like microhabitat within sites, uh, the size of patches of habitat and the connectivity between these patches of habitat, presence or lack of sympatric congeners, so other frog species, other Euperolea species, um, are they sharing the same habitat? Are those other Euperolea species maybe competing and pushing out Euperole davisa? Um, and then building and using an occupancy detection model, working out, incorporating all of these above factors, can we predict where Euperolia davisa is then found? So I'll go into some methods now. Uh, this was a pretty fieldwork heavy honors project, um, as you can see by some of these photos, and I'll go into this now. So. Uh, this project was a collaboration with the Northern Territory Government's Department of uh, Environment, Parks and Water Security, um, particularly their Flora and Fauna Division and the University of Melbourne. So I moved up to Darwin and basically from had to build this project from the ground up. Um, first of all, we had no sites. We knew where Euprolia Davis A exists. We know where, where the past records are, but we can't just say we know where you probably David say is and then go and survey there. We have to generate some random sites within habitat um, so we don't bias our results. So we had over a hundred sites that we had to randomly select. Then we had to uh, do some recon at these sites um, and some stakeholder engagements So going out to the sites, ground truthing, working out, can we actually get to these sites? Will people uh, let us on their land and not chase us off with a shotgun? Those kind of things. Um, extensive standardized nocturnal surveys were conducted then, um, basically collecting presence and absence data. So working out, going to these sites and working out, are the frogs here? One, are they not here? Um, and at every site, whether the frogs were there or not, we would then collect habitat data. Um, and in total, we surveyed 99 sites twice. So I'll just run over what I was mentioning before about not being able to go out straight to sites where these frogs have been recorded. Um, this is a snapshot or a satellite image, I should say, of the southeast of Darwin. Um, you can see the urbanization area coming through down here. Um, but basically, this is an area where there's some records where there's you probably Davis say, I don't know if you can see there's like little green dots. Um, and to, to go in and survey these sites, we decided to, within an area of mapped sand sheet heathland, we decided to plot what's called a water inundation index. So it's a satellite image, uh, which I'll skip to now, which 
basically was taken at the end of the previous wet season and it looks at all the water that's on the ground at the time when that image was taken um, or over a couple of separate images. So you can determine, you know, which areas within this sandy kind of habitat are retaining water, which areas have deep water. We, you know, we might want to not survey deep water areas because there's crocodiles and things. So which areas have deep water, which areas have no water, um, and then the in-between. And the in-between is what we're interested in because those shallow depressions are the areas where the frogs might be. Um, so those are the areas where we want to survey within Sandsheet Heathland. Um, and that's the map Sandsheet Heath on top of that. And a satellite image from the Sentinel-2 um, site, re recon and land access and uh, liaising with stakeholders, I guess, was probably one of the most difficult tasks and the most time consuming tasks about this project. Um, I didn't realize when I was going to do the, like generate these random sites that most of them would fall on people's houses or private property. So I would literally have to go and knock on these people's doors and say, hi, can I look for small brown frogs on your property? Um, but yeah, most people were really good. Um, a lot of people were really interested. We made these flyers and uh, posted them in mailboxes all over Darwin. Uh, and rural Darwin, wherever any sites fell on people's land. Um, and, you know, sometimes their neighbours and stuff just to get as much habitat in as we could. Some people really didn't want us on the property, um, which is fair, I guess. But, you know, I'm just a Melbourne Uni student studying small brown frogs. Like, Let me on your property. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, most people were really good. Some people even gave me, you know, their little eight wheel swamp buggies to drive around and some landholders even came out to survey with us because they were really interested on what frogs they had on their land. So that was really good. Uh, nocturnal frog surveys, this was obviously the major part of the research, actually going out and working out where these frogs are, um, you know, doing the on the ground work on the rainy monsoon nights. Um, so surveys consisted of one minute sorry five minutes of call playback when we arrived at a site then we spotlighted around the site for 15 minutes um, just looking to see if we could see any frogs calling uh, and noting what other frogs were around um, and what other wildlife in general uh, and in the end we ended up surveying 99 sites and we surveyed these 99 sites twice between January and the end of Feb, so over two months. So there was a lot of work, um, four days, four nights a week, I should say, out in teams of two um, surveying these little guys. So we also had acoustic monitoring, um, placing song meters at or acoustic recorders at nine sites. Um, this gives us the ability to record these frogs remotely. So basically there are a lot of sites on the further outskirts of Darwin and especially in the areas that I wanted to go to um, that didn't have you probably Davis A records that might get cut off by rivers or flooding during the wet season. Of course, it's too risky to go in there with crocodiles around and things. So by deploying uh, these song meters, we can go out and basically deploy them at the start of the wet season when the areas aren't flooded then pick them up at the end of the wet season um, and hopefully there'll be frogs calling on there. Um, so we can basically determine if the frogs are at a site or not and get a, get presence absence data without being there. So song meters are really good for that kind of thing. Um, so we got three months of nightly frog call data from that and that allows us to maybe later do some temporal or calling analysis and amongst other things. So when making an occupancy detection model, detecting the frogs is a massive part of it. Obviously, if you can't detect a frog at a site, how are you going to work out, you know, if it's actually there or not? Um, and you're not going to get much data if you can't detect them. So there's a lot of challenges when dealing with cryptic species like this. So I'll just, if you look at the photos up here clockwise, see if, just take a second and see if you can spot these frogs in those photos. There's four photos there. Um, there's a, you probably Dave say, in situ in each of those photos. Um, so just have a look and I'm gonna go through now and start putting a little circle over where they are. So yeah, as you can see, they're ridiculously hard to spot. They're covered in sand half the time. They just look like sand. Uh, and 
yeah, you can eye shine them. It's a bit of a skill you have to pick up after many nights out there. It took me a while to get onto it, but yeah, when they're not calling, you can find them sitting out like this. Um, and at each of our sites, we also had another species of Euprolia called the floodplain toadlet, Euprolia inundata. Um, as you can see, this one here, they're a little bit bigger than Euprolia davisei, a um, little bit more of a pointed snout, bigger paratoid glands. Um, and yeah, they've got a, a different call. The call is the most distinct and the best way to differentiate the species. Um, so we worked out that uh, the Howard Springs toe was most detectable when it was calling, obviously because its call is um, distinct from all other frogs in the area. Mind you, there's about 23 other frog species which could be calling um, within the same area that these guys call. And I'll just let you listen to their call now. So if you've got your volume on, just have a listen to this on the video, if it'll play. So that's some footage of male uh, Howard Springs toilets calling during the breeding season. Uh, they've got a little squelchy call, which is really easy to pick up amongst, well, uh, between all the other frog species. If there's heaps of frogs calling, they can still be quite hard to hear. So you have to get your ear in. Um, and the call is, yeah, distinguished from all 20 odd other frog species occupying the same habitat. So now we'll get into a bit of the nitty gritty stuff, basically, the whole point of collecting all this data, habitat data, where the frogs are and et cetera, was to create an occupancy detection model. Um, and what an occupancy detection model, it's a type of species distribution model, um, an empirical model where you can describe the relationships between the probability of occurrence of a species to environmental variables. Um, and then basically use these environmental variables plus your presence absence data to predict where these frogs might occur. Um, and this is just a rough thing I put together that shows some of the variables that I used in the model. So I've got occupancy variables here, which is things like sandiness, the amount of sand sheet, uh, so the patch kind of the size um, and connectivity of sand sheet um, habitat the top, topographic or the wetness index, as I was talking about earlier, presence and percentage of devil devil. So those soil mounds, the presence of white sand at a site and the presence and percentage of tussock cover. Uh, and then the detection variables were air temperature, relative humidity and rainfall, uh, particularly rainfall uh, within the past two days of a survey. So these are our fixed effects and our random effects were site, region, survey zone and observers. These are things that can change quite dramatically between, um, between each survey. So for example, we had different observers out every night, we're at a different site every night, might be at different zones. Um, it's a bit confusing, but even I'm still trying to get my head around all that. Uh, and I used a Bayesian framework to put my model together and to run the model. Um, the reason I did this was so that we could deal with e the ecological, sorry, the complex ecological data um, that we were feeding into it, including combinations of fixed and random effects. Um, and there's just a scary photo of some of the code that we were running to uh, basically work these models. So we'll get into the results. Um, this is a map of Darwin or the northwestern top end of the distribution of Euprolia davisei. So all those white empty circles are the sites, uh, basically all my 99 sites across the uh, greater Darwin region. Um, the blue dots are sites where I detected Euprolia davisei. Um, so you can see we didn't detect them anywhere out here. They were strictly within this area. Um, these are my, the same survey records. So the blue dots are my survey records and the red dots are previous um, survey records. So you might see these two outliers up here. These were actually two range extensions we got for the species by doing these surveys. Um, so you can see they're about pretty much exactly 10 kilometers east and northeast of um, current records. 
which is decent considering they've only got a 40 kilometer radius or range in general any range extension is a good one um, and we were very happy to get this one up in the northeast as this gunpoint region was a high priority survey area um, as part of the northern territory government's mapping the future initiative so you might wonder why are they restricted to this area why aren't we finding them outside um, in these other areas and we think that's because in the gunpoint area up here there is sand sheet heath but there's very little of it so we think they might just not have made it up there um, most of the sand sheet runs through the howard river catchment which runs down here and the elizabeth river catchment which runs down here these are the two catchments which have the most of that sand sheet habitat running along the floodplains. then they don't occur well they don't seem to occur further east than that because you've got a huge barrier uh, to the east, which is the Adelaide River. Um, if you've ever been to the Adelaide River, you might have been up there on a crocodile jumping cruise or something, you'll remember that it is a massive river. It's tidal, it's full of crocodiles, barramundi. If you're a tiny little frog, your chances of getting across there might be quite slim. Um, and then down here, we've got these lines. This is the Finnis Range running, uh, running down here. So the habitat changes quite dramatically from sandy to quite rocky and on this side up um, on Cox Peninsula it becomes sand sheet again however the Finnis range is in between this so we think that might be stopping them getting across um, it's yeah quite rocky and not really uh, the sand that Davis A like to burrow into there's also two quite large river systems down here as well the Darwin and the Finnis river which may also act as an environmental barrier so this is the model or the species distribution model that my uh, that my data basically spat out at the end. Um, I think I managed to get this the night before my thesis was due. So that was a bonus. Um, so you can see basically what you're seeing here is all the green, all the bright green is areas with high likelihood that you will get Euprolea davisei or that Euprolea davisei may occur, I should say. And that's because it's um, incorporating all of those environmental variables where sand sheet heathland is and um, all that, you know, surface water on the ground and stuff, that's all getting picked up in these green areas. Um, and then the red areas and white to gray areas are areas where you basically will have a very low chance of finding these species. And uh, the map on the right is the exact same. It's just got my survey records plotted over the top of it. So you can see, as I was saying, gunpoint up here has very sparse patches of this green sand sheet heathland um, until you get down here. And that's where we started to get them when they're in this habitat. Um, and as you can see, there are still areas within this that remain unsurveyed. So there's definitely recommend recommendations for future surveys within these habitats. Um, I did have song meters and did surveys in these sites out here, but we just didn't get them. And our main reasoning for that is that Finnis range that was running down here, we, we think is providing a barrier. Um, so key results in terms of occupancy, we worked out that it was really the sandiness of a site, the size of sand sheet patches, um, the presence of sand mounds, presence of white sand and tussock grasses that were driving uh, whether Davy say would occupy a site or not. Um, and then about detectability, it was really temperature uh, and two day rainfall were the big ones. So humidity didn't really do anything because it was humid all the time. Um, but yeah, temperature and two day rainfall. So rainfall two days before would often get you probably Davis say calling and often those big heavy rainfall events would be when you'd go out on a survey on that night or a few days after um, and they'd be calling quite strongly after two days if it hasn't rained they'll kind of stop calling again so basically yeah as I said the sandiness of a site the patch size presence of devil devil soil mounds and tussock grasses Topographic wetness uh, was neg negatively associated, but all the others were positively associated with the occupancy of Euprolea davis at site. Variables likely to influence oral detection were warm nights and significant rainfall. So this just means uh, after warm nights and significant rainfall, you're probably gonna go out and hear and be more likely to hear Euprolea davis calling at a site, uh, which will make them more detectable. 
Do these make ecological sense? Yeah, they do. We know Davis Hay like these soil mounds. We know um, if we've worked out that they like these the tussocks, um, deep sandy sites where they can burrow into and the sand sheet habitat, you know. For example, this photo down the bottom, you'll get Davis Hay in this sand sheet here. You won't get them calling in this forested habitat like this unless it's sandy and a bit more sparse than that. Um, how can we use a species distribution model? So we can use it to inform conservation and management decisions, urban developments and roadworks, mining, uh, cultural, sorry, agricultural clearing and pastoral lease, all these things, um, you know, people would have to, they could look at this species distribution model when they're putting in applications and say, right, we have to get someone out to do a survey because these frogs, these threatened frogs might be here. Um, so yeah, we can use them for future survey design, uh, work out the best time and conditions to survey for these species, uh, making sure people are surveying the correct areas and not going to a nearby area um, that, you know, they might be surveying 30 metres from a site and surveying the wrong habitat, um, which could drastically impact a population. And yeah, filling knowledge gaps of this um, quite still unknown little frog. Also, yeah, conservation of lice. So models currently are being used and applied by the Northern Territory Department of Parks um, and Water Security for these things, specifically mining applications, as this kind of has the, the biggest threats to this species, we think at the moment. Um, next steps, we're trying to get this frog listed further. So yeah, it's listed in the Northern Territory under the Territory Parks and Wildlife Conservation Act as vulnerable, um, but this doesn't, doesn't give us much to, to work with. So it's not listed on the EPPC Act and it's not listed, or well, it's listed as data deficient um, on the IUCN, which basically means not enough is known about it. So we're pushing for an uplisting to a threatened category at the moment, and we've nominated it to go to be listed as an endangered species. So we're really hoping um, that that goes through because these little guys need all the help we can get at the moment. Um, and just some extensions. Basically, we didn't collect data for only the Howard Springs toilet, we collected the data for 22 frog species. So within that, there's a potential for further research. You could create a distribution model with any of these species um, and the incorporated habitat data within the Sanchez Heathland. Um, and yeah, you could look at species interact interactions or assemblages. So uh, another thing I wanted to look at with my honors was there's three Euprolia that inhabit, us, inhabit these sand sheet sites. So you probably Davis A and you probably Inundata, plus the stonemason toilet, you probably Lithomotor. So I wanted to work out uh, these two other species of you probably pushing out you probably Davis A from sites where they all occur. So that's another thing. Um, I didn't get around to it in my research, but you know, someone else might want to look into that. It would be a really interesting project. Um, and also, yeah, the acoustic monitoring data so yeah, three nights of nightly um, data from nine sites across the study area and potential for uh, calling analysis, a temporal and calling analysis amongst many other things. Um, and I'll just finish with this video. So if you can all listen again, this is basically most or some, I should say, of the other frog species which we uh, encountered during our surveys on these at these sites. So just have a listen. Uh, to what the NT wet season sounds like. So as you can see, it's a very loud place in the wet season. It's really cool. We walk out of those sites some nights and we would not be able to hear each other for about five minutes because we were just deafened by the sound. Um, and yeah, so I'd just like to acknowledge Dr. Graham Gillespie and team from the Flora and, Flora, Flora and Fauna Division from the Department of Parks and 
uh, Environment and Water Security in the NT. Um, Jeff Hurd, Dr. Jeff Hurd, and Dr. Jian Yan, my primary supervisor. So yeah, I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, yeah, thank you for coming. I'm glad so many people could turn up. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, Matt. Um, first off, congratulations on finishing a research project with some ridiculously hard to find frogs. That in itself, <laughs> I yeah, think you should get, get an honours honest degree for just finding one, let alone anything else. It's yeah. crazy. Um, so what we'd like to do now is open the floor to questions. So you're welcome to unmute, you're welcome to turn your videos back on and unmute your microphones if you'd like. But if you can keep your microphones on if you're not talking, um, that's really helpful. Um, Matt, if you want to stop the recording as well, please, and maybe stop sharing your screen so that we can see everybody's beautiful faces as well. That'd yep. be really great. Yeah. Um, so if you have any questions, um, what we'll do 